emotionally and psychologically for these moments of change and complexity. Um, and you have this really beautiful saying about life's beauty is inseparable from its fragility. Um, and so could you talk to us about what does that mean and how does that apply to the, the current moment we're all experiencing? Well, I think we all know this internally at some level that there is this complex and intimate, beautiful relationship between the beauty of life and the fragility of life. We love and then we lose. We are healthy until we are ill. We in jobs in which we need it until those jobs are no longer. We might, you know, roll our eyes and yell at our kids and ask them to tidy their rooms and then one day there's silence where that child once was, they're now making their way in the world. And so there's this complex interplay between the beauty and the fragility of life that just is what makes the wholeness of life. And yet so often in our narratives in society we talk about, you know, focusing on success and being positive all the time and goal setting and you know there's this whole even even our avoidance that we have really I think at a very broad level in society our avoidance of talking about what is the most common feature that all of us or common experience that all of us will go through which is to die and yet so much of our society is constructed around preventing avoidance denial of this reality and you know the circumstance that we're in now is not something that we ask for, but life is calling on every single one of us to move into the place of wisdom in ourselves, beyond the thinking, judgy, county mind, into the space of wisdom and, and fortitude and solidarity, community, courage. And it's a calling for all of us right now that I think is just so enmeshed in what is in our absolute undeniable reality of the fragility of life right now. Thank you for that. And I, I mean, and I think that for a lot of us, when we're thinking about how our lives have changed, um, you know, and we are approaching this idea of happiness, so many of the things that at one point uh, really did bring us a lot of joy, being able to go out with friends and socialize and spend physical time with loved ones, uh, so many of those things have changed. But, you know, I guess in, in this moment, how do you advise that we cultivate happiness and, and joy with all everything that's going on? Well, so just to be clear, firstly, I'm not anti-happiness, um, which you'll understand why I'm saying this as I, as I progress. I'm not anti-happiness. Um, I think, though, that often, again, we have this narrative in society that is about be happy and be positive. And... Uh, whilst that may sound like it's the right thing and it sounds like that is the thing that we should all be saying you know just be positive or you know when people are experiencing cancer they're told to just be positive or when people are being marginalized or discriminated against to stop being so angry you know we have in our society this um almost judgment that happiness and joy are the most important emotional experiences that we can have and on the other hand, the so-called bad or negative emotions are frustration, anxiety, grief, loss, fear, sadness. Um, and so what we do is we often become very comfortable with happiness and we become uncomfortable with those difficult emotions and we push them aside. And I'm not anti-happiness, but I think what so often happens when we try to pursue some idea of, well, going out was what made me happy or... Um, I can't go clubbing this weekend and now I can't be happy, is what we're doing is we're basically establishing the anchor point of happiness around expectations or goals. And what we know actually when we look at the scientific literature is that when we overly strongly focus on happiness as a goal, we actually become less happy over time. And it's this really interesting paradox because it's we almost seeking something as opposed to just living our lives in a way that is compassionate and accepting. So I'm not anti-happiness, but what I would say is that rather than trying to find happiness, I think now for all of us, there's actually space for us to come into ourselves, to come into our emotions, to not try to brush away the grief or the loneliness or the anxiety, but to rather face into that. Um, one of the stories that I spoke about in my TED talk, which has really 
stuck with me my whole life was when I was about five years old, I became absolutely aware of the fact that I was going to die one day. And this is very normal. Around the age of five or six years old, children become aware of their own mortality. And this was what I experienced. I became aware of the fact that I was going to die and that my parents weren't going to be around forever. And I would find my way into my parents' bed at night, you know, squeezing between the two of them. And I would say to my father and my mother, you know, promise me that you won't die. Promise me you won't die. And I was five and I was desperate. And my father was so profoundly beautiful in the way he held me during those nights. He didn't try to build some false narrative. Oh, just be positive. I'm going to be around. Don't worry about me. Everything's fine. He didn't try to build some false narrative between me and reality. What he said to me is, Susie, it's normal to be scared. We all die and it's normal to be scared. And what we need to do is we need to not try to do away with fear, but rather to reach inside ourselves and to find the courage. And I think that is a message for our times, which is not to try and rush aside or belittle or judge yourself if you're experiencing difficult emotions. This is a tough time. But rather, if we can use strategies to enable us to be with those emotions in healthy ways, which is the whole foundational uh, experience of what I call emotional agility, this is ultimately what will enable us to bring the best of ourselves forward in every aspect of how we love and how we lead in these times how we parent and how we come to ourselves. And I think that that's ex exactly what we'd love to hear more about is this emotional agility that you just referenced. And you know, what what is that? Let's maybe just first start there. What What is emotional agility? What are the, the main tenets of, of this philosophy? Well, the first part of emotional agility, which is really critical is moving away from, I think what so many of us have, I did some research where I was asking people, you know, when you have difficult emotional experiences, what do you tend to do with them? And I did surveys of around 70,000 people. And what I found is that a large majority of us may be uh, you know, driven by this narrative of, oh, I've got to be happy and positive all the time. What we tend to do when we have these difficult emotional experiences is we do, we judge them, we belittle them, we push them aside, or we get stuck in them. So the language that I use is we often bottle our emotions, we rationalize them and we push them aside, or we brood on them and we get stuck in them. And what emotional agility is, and I can talk about this you know, in terms of its principles, but also its strategies in more detail, but really what emotional agility is, it's the ability to be with ourselves, our full selves, our full emotional experience, in ways that are compassionate, because this is tough and these emotions are real. So we need to be compassionate with ourselves and others. We need to be curious, um, you know, what is my frustration telling me about what's important to me? What is my guilt telling me when I'm interacting with my children right now? What is that telling me about what's important? What are the, the anger that I might feel because I know that there are so many millions of people who are jobless or disenfranchised or in situations of profound difficulty right now and I've got anger towards that. What does my anger tell me about what I value? So if we can move into a space where instead of pushing aside these signposts that our emotions give us and instead move into a space where we are compassionate with them, where we're curious with them, and where we start saying, how can I, even in the midst of fear, I don't need to do away with my fear, the fear just is. It's my body, it's my mind, it's my emotions doing their job. Our emotions have evolved to help us. And so when we feel fear, that's our emotion trying to help us. So the important thing here is not to do away with it, but also not to get stuck in it. So to develop a sense of what are courageous steps that I can take, even in the midst of a reality that I didn't choose, and that isn't of my asking, how can I bring myself forward in a way that's courageous and connected? So in brief, emotional agility is the ability to be with ourselves in our fullness with compassion and curiosity so that we can live in ways that are values connected.
that's beautiful. And I think that, that for me, that's definitely really meaningful in thinking about how I'm personally experiencing a lot of this. And I imagine for a lot of folks. And, and so I'm curious then in thinking about emotional agility pre, you know, uh, pandemic and today, what are some of the differences between how you might have practiced that before and, and how you're practicing that now? What are some of the, the ways practicing emotional agility has changed? Well, I think the principles of emotional agility are actually fundamental principles of psychological health and wellness. Regardless of the context that we're in, regardless of whether we're stressed in our job or, uh, you know, struggling to be with our children in a way that's effective over dinner time, you know, those might have been the day-to-day -day realities that we're experiencing. And I think that all that's really happened is <clears throat> the need for emotional agility becomes so much more profound and so much clearer and we actually have the space to be able to practice this because we're not running around from meeting to meeting we aren't going from shopping center to shopping center what we've got is the place that we are in we've got the resources that we have and we also are deciding whether we let that narrative that is coming through the media own us, whether we're going to let our emotions own us, or whether we are going to exert some kind of empowerment and connection over these experiences and whether we're going to own it. And, you know, what always just comes to mind, and it's, it's probably, um, you know, a very oft-used phrase, but it really, I think, is so profoundly important right now, I think, as I'm speaking of that beautiful Viktor Frankl idea. Viktor Frankl, who survived the Nazi death camps, who describes what I think is the most profoundly powerful human sentiment. And it's this, that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose. And it's in that choice that lies our growth and freedom. We didn't choose these circumstances. Often what happens is we get hooked. We get into an experience where there's no space between stimulus and response. We either mindlessly, you know, go onto our Twitter feeds and we engage with the news and we catastrophize or we're feeling so stressed out or we're avoiding. Or... And so I think this is really a time of creating space between stimulus and response. We do that by being open to what we're experiencing, by saying, what do I need to do here, by being intentional and the particular strategies. So I think in short answer to your question, you know, emotional agility are basically the skills that are foundational to wellness within ourselves, to being healthy within ourselves every day. What's happening in this context is we are needing to bring those skills with greater courage and strength to the situation that we face. And I think it's so interesting that you um, you look at the, this having this additional space, this time where we're a little more slowed down. Um, it sort of creates an environment where we can be more thoughtful of, about embracing our emotions and thinking about them. Um, and so I'm curious too, I guess, and, and if we can look at some specific issues that people might be experiencing. Uh, I think one of the big ones with social distancing is that a lot of folks who at one point you know went to an office are now working at home. They're working at home, they're sleeping at home, relaxing at home. Um, and so maybe in talking about that specifically, what are some, some ways that, first, what are some of the ways this might impact us? And then what are some areas that you think you can um, apply from emotional agility to yeah. uh, to this new, this new normal? Yeah, so and a very important point here is I think, you know, when I talk about having more space to have these experiences, of course, that doesn't mean we are always alone. We might be as I am. I've got two young children who are now home from school and I'm trying to do my work and I'm trying to look after them and there's a lot that's going on. But we aren't spending hours commuting, you know, most most of us. Um, we aren't spending hours distracting or avoiding outside of the house. So we're really starting to think about how am I using what I've got in this space, in this context right now? So, you know, one of the things that I think is really profoundly important is when we think about social distancing, I think a better way for us to all be thinking about this, originally the media had used this language of social distancing, but actually what we're thinking about here is 
physical distancing, physical distancing. We can still, if we are social creatures, which many of us are, we still need to be able to look for meaningful quality interactions that are really critically important to us right now. So we know that we can be lonely in a crowd. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't need when we think about loneliness, loneliness is not just, oh, I'm by myself, therefore I'm lonely. You can be in a crowd of people and be lonely. So what is it that we think about when we think about how do you mitigate against or how do you ameliorate loneliness? Loneliness is actually um, a function of whether our, our interactions are meaningful or not. So again, to this idea that emotions tell us a story behind our most difficult emotions are signposts to the things that we care about. If you find yourself feeling lonely, as an example, what is that loneliness the signpost of? The loneliness is often the signpost that you value presence and connectedness, and that you don't have enough of it now. So that loneliness is telling you that there's something that you value, that you need to be moving more in the direction of. And so you can start asking yourself, what are some small changes that I can make that are really important to me right now in this context of loneliness? Are there people that I'm reaching out to that I maybe haven't spoken to for a few years? Is there a way that I, you know, I have this really remarkable experience sometimes where I feel like even when we're speaking to someone, we're speaking beyond the person. Um, there's something beautiful that I do in one of my uh, exercises that I've actually done in some TED workshops before where I ask people just to silently look at another person. There's this beautiful phrase in South Africa, Sabobona, it's a greeting. Sabobona means I see you, and by seeing you, I bring you into being. And in the workshops, sometimes what I do is I'll stop people and I cue them and I say Sabobona, and what I'm doing is I'm asking people to look beyond the eyes, to look into the soul and the love and the light and the hurt in the person that's in front of you. And I've been doing it with my children, you know, they don't necessarily love it, but instead of doing a quick hug when they're at the computer trying to do their learning each day, I'm starting to say to them, you know, let's just look at each other. Let's just connect with each other. Let's see the person behind the person. So I think that there are ways that we can, whether it's an online meeting with our colleagues or phoning someone that we care about, or even how we look at a person, there is meaning that brings us out of loneliness, and meaning that brings us out of social isolation in ways that are really profound and beautiful. I have some exciting news to share with you. We've launched a new podcast at TED. It's called Pin Drop. In each episode, host Salim Reshamwala journeys across the globe to find the most surprising ideas. It, it's a bit like listening to a place give a TED talk. With local journalists and creators as your guide, you'll weave through the streets of Bangkok with a motorcycle midwife, time travel with dinosaurs behind a hardware store in New Jersey, and meet a guy who dresses up as a luchador to protect citizens from traffic in Mexico City. Check out Pin Drop on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Susan, I just wanted to uh, nip in with a couple of questions from the yeah. wonderful crowd of people who, who are watching. Um, so, so I'm thinking, especially I think some people watching you know, are literally in a situation now where they're they have spent days alone, and yeah. it's a fearful, it's a fearful time. Um, and so, one question is, you know, what do you mean when you say, "reach inside of us to find courage"? Like, what, how do you actually do that? Well, firstly, what we know is the way fear operates. So, when people are feeling fearful, or when the situation is ambiguous, as it, as it is right now. Usually what we try to do, and, and this is literally a cognitive um, reality for us, is that our mind tries to fill in the blanks. So we don't know the answers and we try to fill in the blanks. So we 
might catastrophize or we might you know develop huge amounts of anxiety or we go to our twitter feed in search of the answers and often what that does is it actually provokes the very opposite of what we need what that provokes is it often provokes more anxiety more fear and more you know we talk about viruses and we talk about physical contagion um, but we also know that people can experience very real levels of emotional contagion Emotional contagion is when you, in subtle ways, pick up on the emotions of other people because, uh, as human beings, again, we've evolved to pick up on these cues. And so I think, you know, when I'm saying reach inside of yourself, when we think about intentionality, intentionality is this idea that rather than being mindlessly sucked into our experience, which I have been too, you know, this is, this is a common, common human experience, we get sucked into our news feeds. Instead, we're starting to ask ourselves questions of, is this, is this helping me? And is there some alternative way that I can be engaging? So I've had lots of people contact me recently just saying things that, you know, I, I've just taken such joy in creating a little garden for myself. I have got in a list of books that I really wanted to read and I haven't. I've reached out to a friend who I haven't spoken to for years and where we had some silly argument about something and we can't even remember what that argument was, but I now know that whether I'm right or wrong doesn't matter more than a more important question, which is, is my action serving me? Is it serving the person, the loved one, the human being that I most want to be? So if we can start reaching inside ourselves and saying, you know, what are ways that I can, if I'm lonely, how can I contribute? How can I connect? What are ways that I can come to my experience so that it's intentional and it's values connected? And also, if you're feeling lonely, and so many of us are, also be compassionate with it. This, this is tough. We often live our lives as if we're in a never-ending Iron Man or Iron Woman competition, you know, where we've got to have goals and be healthy and be fit and be... There are all these things that we feel we've got to do every single day. We've got to be the best leaders. We've got to be... I think just, you know, breathing into the experience is really important. But, Chris, I think it's a great question because there are other practical things that we can do in relation to this experience as well. Um, Often we use this language, we say, I am lonely, I am sad, I am angry. And it's a normal default way that we describe how we feel. But if we think about the language of that, what we're doing is we are saying, I am, all of me, 100% of me is this singular experience. I am sad. So what we're starting to do when we use that language is, we do it unintentionally, but what we're starting to do is we're starting to define ourselves by our emotion. We are not our emotion. We own our emotions. They don't own and define us. So what we want to do is we want to show up to our emotions with compassion and curiosity, but we also don't want to get stuck in our emotions. So simple strategies that can be really helpful to people is instead of saying, I am sad, label your thoughts, your emotions, or your feelings for what they are. They are not fact. They are thoughts, they are emotions, they are feelings. So you might say something like, I'm noticing the feeling that I'm sad. I'm noticing the urge to shut down the conversation with my spouse, or I'm noticing the urge to keep going on my social media feed right now. I'm noticing the thought that things are never going to get any better. What you start doing when you, this is a, a mindfulness technique, but what you're really doing is you are labeling your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings as thoughts, emotions, feelings. And when you do this, what you start doing is you create that space that I spoke about between stimulus and response. No longer are you defined, you are now able to see them for what they are. And then you can start saying, I'm noticing that I'm feeling sad. What is that telling me about what I care about? 
and how can I bring more of that thing into my life? And it's going to be different for different people. What's striking, Susan, about the audience in general, and uh, this, this surprises me, so a lot of the questions aren't even about, oh, I'm feeling, you know, this terrible um, neediness and, and fear right now. They're actually questions about how can I help? And you how mentioned there about, uh, how can I help? Yeah, you mentioned there about contribution and about compassion. I, I wonder, is it the case? Two things. First of all, how can people help? Like, practically, how can they help others when we're all in this isolated world right now? Um, but secondly, can that, can that process itself actually help people, that shifting from feeling the pain to, to the sort of the agency of reaching out and trying to do something, can that, can that make a difference? That's almost the spirit of many of the questions I'm reading here. Yes, and it's, it's such an important question. It's this thing of, Sawabona, I see you, but in seeing myself, I'm able to see others too, this profoundly important way of seeing others. And uh, yes, you know, finding ways that you can contribute. There are so many people in pain right now. There are people who are in their houses who haven't spoken to another soul for days. There are people who need help with essential groceries and services. There are shopkeepers who are struggling. And so within our community, instead of spending our time, you know, trying to get sucked or, or trying to stop ourselves even from being in this vortex, um, which I think for so many of us is that experience, is really thinking about what are practical ways that we can do it. And what is, what's, what's so true for us as human beings is we often think that in order to make a contribution, we've got to do something huge. It's got to be grand. It's got to be massive scale. But, you know, if we think about the need to belong, every single one of us needs to belong. And we know that we can half one other person's pain just by being that person's person today. That might just be a phone call. But if we can reach beyond ourselves, that's healing for others and it's healing for ourselves as well. And so this is often not about these big things. It's often about what I call tiny tweaks, small values connected actions that we can take that are committed. And, and even, you know, being at home, being physically distant, there's, there's courage. There's courage in doing that. I mean, we're doing it because we know that it's the right thing, but there's also courage in looking inside of ourselves and, and, and owning that you're doing that not only because you have to, but because that is something that is profoundly important, that you care about others. And I think actually this is also a conversation to be having with children right now. You know, I think, you know, often what happens with, with our kids is we say, well, these are the rules. You know, this is what we've got to do now. But what are we doing? We're really trying to help our children develop their own sense of values and character. And so we can start doing this by showing up to our children's emotions. How are you feeling instead of trying to, you know, say everything's going to be okay, don't worry about it, and, and try to brush over it. Our children are feeling what they're feeling. If we can show up to those feelings with compassion, but then also ask our children, um, you know, what are ways that you think you can bring yourself to your friends or to your connections? Or how are ways that you are living right now connected with who you want to be as a person? These are incredible times for us to, we didn't ask for them, but we are developing our resilience and our character and the character of those around us without a doubt. All right, keep the, uh, keep the questions and comments coming, uh, online crowd. Whitney, um, back to you. Thanks so much, Kristen. It's so great to hear what everyone else is um, thinking. Those questions are wonderful. And I mean, and, and Sue, to your, to your last comment about children and, and how you can really have conversations with them about what's going on. You know, a lot of them may be experiencing some of the same emotions that, that we're all experiencing, but maybe with a little more confusion because they have yes. less life experience. And so how, I mean, how can we talk to children if, you're, if there are parents out there about what's going on out there and how they can deal with their emotion? So I'm going to say this and then I want to give a little story of, of how I did the very opposite. And, and there's a reason for it. Um, the, the most important thing that we know, you know, I spoke about instead of saying I am sad, you noticing that you're feeling sad. Another very, very important part of being effective with our emotions is being 
granular with our emotions. And what I mean when I say being granular is often we use very big labels to describe our emotions. You know, people might say, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. That's the most common one that I hear. Um, you know, in, in my work, in the work that I'm doing in organizations, very often people say I'm stressed. Um, but there's a world of difference between stress and disappointment, or stress and overwhelm, or stress and fear. And what we know psychologically is when we label our emotions in a more granular way, when we move beyond the I am stressed into what is this emotion really, then what it does is it helps us to, again, move into that space of ourselves and it, it does something really powerful in our brains. It starts helping us to understand what is the cause of the emotion and what is the pathway forward. So we're now moving beyond this, oh, it all feels stress into, this is overwhelm. I can do something with overwhelm. I can create pockets of control, okay? If my stress is lonely, I can look for opportunities to reach out. So emotion granularity is really important. When it comes to children, the same applies. We often, as parents with really, really good intentions, want to just jump in and say, you know, the child says, mommy, I'm worried. You know, don't worry, it'll be okay. And again, I take that lesson of my father, you know, it's normal to be scared. What we know for our children is simply showing up to them, simply seeing them and holding space for them to feel what they feel is probably the most important way that, that children can develop a sense of security in the context of chaos. So that's the showing up part. The second part is, again, we are wanting children to feel that their emotions don't own them. When we say to kids, like, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay, or just be happy, what are we teaching? We're teaching that some emotions are good and some emotions are bad and that the bad ones should be done away with. And so when we do that very often, children don't get practice with feeling what a difficult emotion feels like and they don't then develop the, the, the strength and the capacity, the psychological resource that that builds. So when a child is feeling what they're feeling, that's what they're feeling. If we can show up to that with compassion, that in of itself is probably the most powerful thing. Then another thing that we can do is we can stop helping that child to label their emotions. We know that children as young as two or three years old are able to start differentiating between angry versus sad, um, I feel